Hello, seventh grade. All right, we're continuing in chapter 16, which remember is about invertebrates, and we are still talking about arthropods. And today I want to take a look at the insect life cycles. Now, particularly what we're going to discover is that they go through a type of metamorphosis. Meta means change, morph means shape. So a metamorphosis means it goes through a change of shape. Now, there is a distinction to be made here, and that is that there are two kinds of metamorphosis. There is incomplete metamorphosis, and then there is complete metamorphosis. Okay? Now, the type of life cycle called incomplete metamorphosis um, is uh, something that happens with a type of molting. All right? Now, an example of this would be the dragonfly. So I want to show you some video clips of a dragonfly and its life cycle. So let me share my screen with you. And we're going to take a look at the dragonfly life cycle and incomplete metamorphosis. Okay, I'm waiting for it to go full screen. Okay, so let's take a look. The dragonfly life cycle and incomplete metamorphosis. All right, the female dragonflies lay their eggs in fresh water. Dragonflies are called nymphs after they hatch. During this stage, they live in fresh water and they go through incomplete metamorphosis to become adult dragonflies. This means they do not have a pupa stage during their metamorphosis, but go through several nymph stages. Some dragonfly nymphs, like this one, have gills in the back of their body to breathe with underwater. Water is driven in and out of the back of their body to ventilate the gills to help in the exchange of gases. Gills may also be on the outside of aquatic insects. Caddisflies, these larvae, damselflies, nymphs, they all have external gills. Like other arthropods, dragonflies have compound eyes. Compound eyes are different from human eyes, remember. They're very good at detecting motion. It's, that's why insects are better at perceiving moving objects than still objects. Dragonfly nymphs eat insects, larvae, and other aquatic invertebrates, such as small crustaceans, annelids, and mollusks, which we've talked about. Without moving the rest of their bodies, dragonfly nymphs can surprise and catch their prey by suddenly extending the jawed labium, or lower lip, which extends from under their mouths. Dragonfly nymphs use their mouth parts to bite and chew. At the end of their final nymph stage, dragonflies climb out of the water onto a rock or plant stalk. The nymph goes through a process to change into an adult, in which it splits out of its larval skin. Many things can go wrong while the dragonfly emerges. The transformation from nymph to adult takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. During this period, the dragonfly is vulnerable and might become food for a hungry bird. Once the dragonfly has emerged from its nymph skin, it is an adult. 
Adult dragonflies breathe air. All right. Now, let me minimize that. All right, now that was incomplete metamorphosis. Now I want you to see complete metamorphosis. And we're going to do this one, not with a dragonfly, but with a butterfly. So you'll notice there's some differences in the stages. For instance, there will be a pupa stage. All right, here we go. Butterflies are curious creatures. They began their lives as caterpillars, hatching from their eggs to do little more than eat, leaves. But then a transformation takes place, and they become beautiful, flying, nectar-drinking insects. Let's learn how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Caterpillars hatch from their eggs a few days after being laid and immediately begin eating. Almost all they do is eat, and after a week or two, the caterpillar is ready to begin its metamorphosis or transformation. The caterpillar attaches itself to the underside of a stem or branch with a small mat of silk and hangs upside down in the shape of a J inside its body underneath its skin. The chrysalis is forming. It no longer needs its caterpillar skin, head, or legs. So, the chrysalis wiggles and twists until it splits and falls off. At first, the chrysalis is soft, but it soon hardens up to protect the developing butterfly inside. It takes about two weeks for the chrysalis to change into a butterfly. Two weeks, two weeks in which almost all of the caterpillar's body is dissolved into a kind of soup until it reforms in the shape of a butterfly. When the butterfly is ready to emerge, the color of its wings will be visible through the chrysalis. Let's watch another butterfly emerge from its chrysalis this time more slowly. Think about the amazing design God has put in, the multi-step procedures, and we're seeing it on the outside. Imagine what's happening on the molecular level, on the cell level, the amount of DNA code that God wrote in order to make this program, so to speak, execute perfectly. And then the beauty on top of that. You know, that's three things that we see in the Christian worldview is truth, goodness, and beauty. Once it's free from the chrysalis, the butterfly looks a bit strange. The butterfly hangs upside down, rumpled and wet, and its abdomen is swollen with fluid. Once the butterfly, or once the wings have reached their full size, the butterfly will wait until they are completely dry before flying off to land on a flower to drink from. Take an up-close look here at the butterfly, the monarch butterfly. What intricate design, what artistry. After a few days, the butterfly will mate, lay new eggs, and the cycle will start all over again. All right, well... That was pretty amazing. That is an example of complete metamorphosis. Okay, now I want you to look with me on page 291 in your book. Page 291. 
it says other interesting arthropods. Okay. Now, not all arthropods are insects. Some other arthropods are barnacles, crabs, lobsters, shrimp, pill bugs, centipedes, and millipedes, scorpions, and tarantulas. These differ from insects in the number of body segments and in the number of appendages, legs, and antenna. There are arthropods in almost every imaginable habitat from the tropics to the polar regions, on the land, in the water, and in the air. Two arthropods people often get confused about are centipedes and millipedes. Both of these look worm-like, but they're not worms. Centipedes are flattened and have one pair of legs per body segment. They have poisonous claws they use to kill small prey. A few species can inflict painful bites on humans. Millipedes have a somewhat rounded body and may roll up in a coil when disturbed. They can have up to 100 body segments, except for a few segments near the front. Most segments have two pairs of legs. Millipedes are not hunters like the centipedes. They eat decaying matter and may occasionally nibble on a live plant. Okay, now there's something I want you to watch. Now, usually when I show you a video, I'm explaining it to you. But this is a pretty famous guy. His name's Coyote Peterson. And he examines the difference between a centipede and a millipede. I think you'll find it very interesting. And so I'm going to let the audio from this video play and let you hear it yourself. So here we are with the differences between these two arthropods, the millipede and the centipede. Welcome to the desert millipede versus the desert centipede. <laughs> Venturing into the nighttime desert is not for the faint of heart, as this cactus-strewn ecosystem is laced with a plethora of nocturnal predators. Whether it be scorpions, spiders, that right there is a black widow, sulpugids, or vinegaroons, these arachnids are certain to be on the prowl as they use the cover of darkness to silently hunt for their prey. Look at that. Does that thing not look like an alien? All arachnids come equipped with eight legs, and most are also armed with a set of fangs or a venom-injecting stinger. That is the most venomous species of scorpion in the United States. And he's on my hand. All right, this makes me a little bit nervous. I want to see if I can get him to just sit still. However, if eight legs, fangs, and stingers aren't enough to scare you, Arizona's Sonoran Desert is also home to a subphylum of creatures with even more legs, the myriapods which consists of centipedes and millipedes. At the end of the day, both of these animals do their best to avoid humans. However, today we are going to capture one of each so we can get them in front of the cameras for an up-close comparison. First, let's talk about the desert millipede. Now, millipede means thousand feet. And each one of these little body segments has two pairs of legs on it. Now, there's no way that I'm going to get underneath this creature and count its legs, but I can tell you from it crawling across my arm that there are a ton of them tickling me right now. It feels like a bunch of little tiny pieces of Velcro grabbing onto your arm hairs. Despite the name, there isn't actually a species of millipede on the planet that has a thousand feet. On average, they have around 400, with the record being 750, more than any other animal in the world. These myriapods have very poor eyesight. They have very simple eyes up front. So they're really using these antenna to help them navigate through the environment. And you'll see as he dances up in the air like that, he's basically looking for what his next move is going to be. If he can't feel anything with those antenna, he's kind of like, whoa, whoa, I've run out of road here. And until he bumps into something that he can walk on, he's just gonna stay put until he can get those front legs planted. Now, the millipede doesn't have many predators, and that's because these little myriapods are actually poisonous. They do have glands that run along the side of their body, and if they are really, really threatened, they will secrete a nasty orange fluid, and it absolutely stinks. I actually got it all over my hands the other night. Now, if you get this poison on your skin, all you need to do is wash your hands with soap and water, and you'll be just fine. Now, I'm completely comfortable with millipedes. They don't bite. 
If it doesn't bite, it can crawl all over me all that it wants. But the centipede is a whole different ball game. And we're gonna get that guy out in a second and get a close look at that venomous little desert dweller. The desert millipede is virtually harmless to humans. And if you encounter one in the wild, just admire it from a safe distance. Okay, now we're on to the part of the episode that I have been dreading. There is no good way to do this. You just have to plop them out and go for it. All right, here we go, ready? Oh boy. Now he's kind of like, oh, I'm on the ground and I'm on the move. Desert centipedes can inflict a very painful and venomous bite. So I stress, never attempt what I am doing. Okay, there we go. Now that I have his head under control, and more importantly, those fangs, I feel a lot better about this situation. Oh, look at how creepy that little desert creature is. Now, what's really interesting is that the centipede means 100 feet. Each species of centipede varies. There's no way that this one has 100 feet, but as they continue to grow and their body segments elongate, they grow more legs. Now, one major difference between the centipede and the millipede is that the centipede has a very flattened body. This allows them to fit into crevices between rocks and allows them to glide very quickly over the surface of the desert. Now, these are voracious predators. They are out here right now walking the washes and searching through the rocks for other animals. They will eat bugs, they will eat scorpions, they will eat lizards, and the ones that grow to the size of the giant desert centipede, they will even take rodents. But the bite from a centipede of even this size is going to put you into some incredible pain. That's why I want to be as careful as possible while handling this myriapod. One really interesting feature about all centipedes is that you see the back end here, this rump. You have these two modified legs on the back end here, which have little hooks in them. And this back end is pretty much a false head. It's the same color as the head is. And these two little modified feet on the back end here have hooks on them. So, so let's say you're a predator and you're coming and you're like, all right, I'm going to get him. I'm going to bite his head right off. These little modified feet go up in the air, boom, and you get pricked with those little spikes. Throws you off guard. The centipede spins around, and that's when you get a bite from those venomous fangs. This is not a creature that is very easy to consume. Centipede venom is not considered deadly to humans. However, the pain has been said to keep a full-grown man on the ground and in pain for several hours. Moral of the story? Steer clear of centipedes. I hope everybody enjoyed this comparison, the desert centipede versus the desert millipede. Both species are native to the Sonoran Desert, and I suggest avoiding both because the centipede is venomous and the millipede is poisonous. I'm Kathy Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right. Well, I hope that that was interesting to you and you're able to tell now the difference between the centipede and the millipede. All right. Well, that's it for today's lesson. You'll have an exit slip to do, so make sure you check Google Classroom for that, and then we'll continue on next week. And I'll see you then. Bye.